Hi, everyone. My name is Al Pasha. I'm a senior director at the IEEE. And I'm here to talk to you about blockchain today, um, more so the state of it. And you know, when you think about blockchain, uh, most people think about it as along the lines of uh, 5G and a number of hype, hype technologies. And it's so easy to get caught up in that. But the reality of blockchain, as well as a number of technologies you see up here and others that are not up here, is that it is a tool. It is not the answer on its own right, OK? And it's important to realize that because right from the get-go, when you start thinking about all the things that can be disrupted, it's not really the technology that's doing the disruption. It's the people that understand the problems well enough to apply the technology to cause the disruption. And so for the purposes of today, let's think about blockchain as just a series of pipes, a series of pipes that allows for your information to go from point A to point B in a manner that you trust, OK? And that the integrity of that information is held, and the information behind it can be verified, OK? Very straightforward in terms of what it really can allow for. But the biggest opportunity, the biggest value of what blockchain truly provides is really these three things, OK? Number one is incentives. Number two is identity. And then number three is trust. Without these three things, the technology doesn't matter. OK? And number one, what do I mean by incentives? Incentives, in the case of blockchain, but really carrots, the carrot principle, people, when they are incentivized to do certain things, have a stronger propensity to do so. And so in, within the blockchain, uh, there are things called tokens. And I like to think of it as Chuck E. Cheese. When you go to Chuck E. Cheese, you put in a dollar, you get that little rat face on the coin, right? <laughs> That's a token, OK? I'm not sure what happened to the slides, but that's OK. We'll keep going. So what, what we want to get to here is, number one, you think of the incentives. Number two, we had identity, OK? Identity really speaks to the matter of you being able to control your own perspective. Let's jump back just a little bit real quick. OK. Uh, well, the good news is we'll be done rather quickly. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so identity is your ability to show yourself as yourself when you want to. And it's also the ability to uh, control what aspects of you are seen, right? It's the same way for your data. And trust. Trust comes in many forms. But primarily, when we think about it from the context of blockchain, it's making sure that that handshake that you have with someone, you're comfortable with. Because if you're not, you're not going to want to have any of those transactions occur. You're not going to want to make use of those solutions, right? And so when we take these ideas and we apply it to this big thing called healthcare, you know, there are a ton of different outputs you'll see. Take Play-Doh, you shove it into that little strainer, and remember the one that lets all that spaghetti out of it? That's what you have, OK? What you see up here through uh, our work, so we, we spoke with, we evaluated 1,500 companies in the space. And predominantly, when we focused on those within healthcare explicitly, here were a list of their various business models. OK? When you look at this, there's a lot up there. When you start to tease it out, you'll see that there's really only three or four different economic models today that folks are looking at. One is platforms. Another is around the ability to set up exchanges. The third is taking the point of data agency and bringing it home. And the fourth, as you look at it, are really services and information around it. Those are the primary different contexts you're seeing today. Doesn't mean that this is where it's going to end up. And as a matter of fact, it won't. What you will start to see, and what some of the organizations are doing today from a proof of concept perspective, is that they are starting to work with a diverse group of stakeholders one that they wouldn't have traditionally. And this is important. This is what makes blockchain disruptive. What blockchain is allowing for is a conversation to occur where folks across what was the traditional value chain, from manufacturer down to end user, now having everyone at the table. 
that's the power of it, okay? And so in the, in the domain of pharma, um, one of my favorite examples to speak about here is the problem of the long tail, right? That there's not enough of market there for companies to want to invest because they've got shareholders that they've got to uh, appeal to. But also that there are patients that can't have their conditions met because of this problem, right? It's a circular sort of logic in some ways. <clears throat> but I'm pleased to say that there are companies, including big pharma companies, that are taking this seriously. And they're utilizing the idea of the token as a double anonymity approach. In other words, you can use a token to share information about yourself, but just that information that can help them understand and apply to the clinical trial, okay? Why do they want to do this? There are inefficiencies in the current system, right? The hiring of CROs then to go find a laundry list of folks to reach out to and then <clears throat> work your way through the entire process, it's time consuming, it's expensive. And you'll see organizations such as what uh, Blockchain Health is doing today, where they've identified a means to go about using the DLT, the distributed ledger technology, think of it as an accountant's book that no one can change, and they're using this as a method to allow all of the players across that clinical trial process come together, share that information faster, and doing it in a way that doesn't allow for, let's say, um, confusion to result. So they're, they're very much looking at the verifiability of it. There's another organization uh, called Hashed Health, and they're working on the aspect of it where patients are incentivized, along with doctors, to follow certain protocols with the, the primary goal of having a more completed data set available of you, the patient, okay? Now, I'll talk a little bit later about some of the, the pieces of that, but, but all this to say that there are some very powerful opportunities within the space of pharma. I only mentioned two right now. There's another one called iSolve, and what iSolve is doing is they're bringing together the investing community with the value chain to start to identify what are the real problems and how can we put the money against that to help to accelerate towards real solutions, okay? But that leads me to that point on patient data, which is who owns that data? How much of that data is yours? And further, what can you do with it once you have it? There's an organization called UBase, and what UBase is doing is they are currently working with hospitals right now, um, some in Canada, to start to give patients greater data agency over their information. And this is very powerful, because this is the type of thing that can fundamentally change the way the supply chain works today, right? When you, when I, when we have more agency over our data, when we have more agency over our information, and we are the source of complete information for ourselves, that, pra that places a greater degree of pressure on the entire current supply chain of our personal information, right? Today, where does that information reside? Insurance companies have your information, right? Doctors have pieces of your information. Other places have it. Your Fitbit has pieces of your information, right? Your online forms have some of your information. The information exists in many places. What UBase is doing is helping to get us beyond that and give us back agency of our information. This is powerful. And there are innovations occurring around the idea as well with respect to incremental changes, right? The idea of blockchain is not readily accepted because it's not so quick to understand and grasp when you start going into the, the underlying layers. But what is important is that the innovations that people are starting to look at, even incrementally, are how can we use this technology to help with medical records, right? That's a big problem in the room. And so what many are doing today is they're working with the Epics Cerners out there to figure out ways to use aspects of the technology to help move things forward. So they're taking a slow, longer approach, but it will also net towards positive results. I'd like to just close with this. The real potential of blockchain can only be realized by you being a part of it. There's a number of startups all over the world that are working on problems, but without your voice in there, they won't be realized, they won't be solved, and they won't matter. So 
<laughs> while I'm at time, I ask you to just think of two things. One, if there's a company that you're interested in connecting with, please reach out to Larry, myself. We're happy to help facilitate. Number two, there's a, a giant opioid event that's coming up. If you're interested in sharing your ideas around it, please go to opioidhealthsummit.org. Share your ideas and help us focus and solve the problem. That's my time. Thank you.